All right. Well, welcome everyone to uh, another edition of the Garden Hour. We're happy that you are able to join us today. I know we kind of got stuck in uh, another cold snap here across the state of Missouri, but uh, sunshine and, and warm weather, hopefully right around the corner. Um, I'm Justin Kay. I'll be, be the host today. And if you haven't joined before, um, just know that we do have hort specialists all across the state of Missouri, and we're here to support and assist Missourians uh, with their gardening questions, challenges. So if you haven't reached out to your local hort specialist, definitely do so. We're always happy to help, ha happy to troubleshoot, brainstorm, and, uh, and get you information that can be helpful to, to solve your problems. Uh, just know also that we do live stream via YouTube. If you're joining us via Zoom, we do have that that YouTube live stream option. And we have a great YouTube channel with curated content. We archive all of our past garden hours uh, for a rainy day. You want to check out some of those. And then we do a weekly uh, highlight snippet from the previous garden hour. So for instance, Last week, we had one on container vegetable gardening, which is a really popular topic. And uh, before that, I think we had one on the 2024 periodical cicada emergence, which is a very uh, fascinating uh, biological phenomenon that'll be happening this year. So definitely check that out and check out those past snippets. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our host today, uh, Jennifer Shooter. Thank you, Justin, and good afternoon, everyone. We have a lot of good topics to get through today, and we will start off with the weather report from Zach. Great. Thank you, Jennifer and Justin. And as I'm pulling up my slides here, welcome everyone to, to April. As Justin mentioned, it's a little colder than we might be uh, used to for April, but I think by the end of uh, going through the weather today, you'll be happy with the warm up that we're, we're expecting here. But now that we are in April, we can put March in the, the rear view mirror. And uh, March was a month that kind of continued the trend from February of above normal temperatures, uh, but we didn't quite see the record breaking warmth we saw in, in February with temperatures uh, 10 to 12 degrees above normal. But still notable uh, that that March was above normal as well. Uh, so anywhere from four to seven degrees uh, above average for a lot of these locations. And because of that, we've just really had a, a warm late winter and, and early swing, early spring. And that's really contributed uh, to things like our, our early vegetation emergence and things like that. And so uh, it looks like also as we get into April, we'll, we'll continue to see uh, these above normal temperatures, at least in the near term. Uh, precipitation during March was uh, pretty variable. I, I think the best way to uh, show this precipitation is the map on the right, which shows our a percent of normal precipitation during March. And so where you see those greens and blues in a few spots, that's where enough rainfall fell to be above average for the month of March. So if you look, uh, especially kind of from Southwest to Northeast across the state from Springfield North to St. Louis, we did have some areas that, that got heavy rainfall in March and were above average, but then you also see a lot of yellow and, and that orange too and did have locations that missed out on the heaviest rainfall and some of those localized thunderstorms. And in those locations, it is a concern as we still have drought across the state um, and have had really two consecutive dry months for, for some of these locations that, that finish March with below average precipitation. But as we head into April and, and we've already started out with the bang, uh, this is typically for Missouri a very active uh, month for precipitation. So uh, the saying that April showers bring May flowers definitely applies here in Missouri. Uh, so if we look at our, our mean monthly precipitation, uh, we, we're going from February where the statewide average was just around two inches to April now where we average close to four inches of rainfall. And so uh, while April's not our wettest month on average, that's usually uh, May, it is still significantly wetter than those those January months. And so um, on the left here, if you see the map, we're expecting anywhere from 
three inches of rainfall during the month of April on average for far northwest Missouri and almost up to six inches if you get down into the boot heel. So uh, a lot more precipitation expected climatologically than what we saw in, in February and March. And so as I mentioned, we've, we've already uh, co compiled quite a bit of precipitation so far this month here. And so this map really just shows our, our rainfall across the state from Sunday night uh, through this morning. And what we can see is just about all of the state picked up some rainfall, uh, except for a, a few spots in the far southeastern part of Missouri. But uh, really, uh, most of these rainfall totals were right in line with what we'd expect for our weekly average, anywhere from a half inch to one inch. Uh, but where you see this band, uh, again, north of Springfield and over to St. Louis, we did have some really locally higher rainfall totals. Uh, two or three inches and even a few spots that touched four inches of rainfall uh, from this last system. So wasn't as widespread as we'd like to see the rainfall, um, but definitely some locations starting out April picking up a, a good amount there. And so that leads us to today as we're kind of watching this rainfall move off. There are some isolated showers still around the state and slowly drifting off to the east. But in the wake of our, our latest system, we're left with a pretty uh, messy and blustery air mass here today. And so on the left are our high temperatures for today across the state, anywhere from the 40s to the north and, and getting into the 50s to the south, um, but lots of abundant cloud cover across the state. And on the right shows our winds for today. And that's really what's making it uncomfortable as we see uh, these arrows called wind barbs here, all pointing from the northwest uh, so we're seeing those winds bring in cold air from the northwest and sustained winds of around 20 miles per hour. So we'll make it feel a lot cooler uh, than those 40s or 50s. But the good news is we're going to slowly warm up and dry out over the next few days. And so here I'll show the, the high temperatures for Thursday on Friday. Thursday and Friday, excuse me. By Friday, all the state is at least looking at a high of 50 with some 60s in the forecast as well. Um, but the low temperatures are, are also important over the next few days with these highs in the 40s and 50s. We also expect temperatures to drop down to near freezing over the next three nights. So tonight through Friday night, I would say patchy frost is, is likely all three nights. Um, doesn't really look like a hard freeze, but, but definitely frost where those temperatures are getting down to around freezing. And so we can see the lows tonight really in the mid to, to low 30s. Tomorrow night's probably our most widespread frost. We'll have more clear skies and cool off a little bit more into the, the lower uh, 30s. And then uh, some, some residual near freezing temperatures on Friday night as well. Although by that point, we'll be warming up, especially in western Missouri. So watch out for that pat patchy frost over the next three overnights. Uh, I always like to show these. These are, our, for Missouri, our, our average last spring hard freeze, or 28 degrees Fahrenheit on the left, and average last spring frost, uh, so any temperature below 36 degrees Fahrenheit on the right. And you can see this time of year, this first week of April is generally when most of the, the state on average sees uh, their last hard freeze. And so we did have a hard freeze early last week. Uh, it's looking like in the forecast, we might not have uh, another one over the next couple weeks as well. So we might've had our last hard freeze a little bit early, um, but as you can see on the right, we do typically see these frost events occur into late April. And just for fun, uh, to show that climatologically, we can still have some anomalous frost and freeze uh, conditions occur. Here's the the last date that, or the extreme, extreme last date of that, that final spring frost across the state. And you can see that occasionally we have had temperatures into the 30s into late May and even June 1st here in Marble Hill, Missouri. So uh, an unusual frost isn't out of the question as we get into May, but hopefully we'll, we'll see the end of those frosts uh, along with our average in, in late April here. Um, but after Friday night, we won't be thinking about the frost and freeze because Saturday and Sunday, our, our temperatures will warm up even more, uh, getting into the 70s by, by Sunday. I think Saturday will be a nice uh, day to get outside and enjoy the weather. Sunday, we can expect probably our next system to move in and, and bring rain chances back to Missouri. And so uh, on the left is our, our surface map forecast for Sunday morning. We can see an area of low pressure here 
neck near Kansas City with a warm front and cold front moving east across Missouri, and that will bring some rainfall on Sunday. And so on the right here is our precipitation amount forecasted for Sunday. And we see uh, this dark green is over a quarter inch of precipitation. So between a quarter inch and a half inch is forecasted for most of northern Missouri uh, with lighter totals to the south. But I must say, usually uh, a system that we're looking at maybe a quarter inch of rainfall we wouldn't pay too much attention to, uh, but this year is a little bit different because we're expecting rain on Sunday. And on Monday, April 8th, we have our eclipse and the eclipse will impact Missouri. And in fact, southeastern Missouri and, and parts of southern Missouri will be in the path of totality. And so at this point, Monday is a, a high stakes weather forecast because we really do want sunshine and clear skies to be able to observe that eclipse. And so um, I put a link here. This is a, a, a resource from the National Weather Service office in Paducah, Kentucky, that covers southeastern Missouri. And they put together a weather page that's a solar eclipse climatology. And I pulled these satellite images from them that show uh, really over the past eight years or so what uh, uh, 2 p.m. on April 8th generally looks like for cloud cover. And you can see there's certainly been some uh, April 8th where we've had abundant clouds across Missouri but also years like last year, which would have been perfect for the eclipse with some clear skies. And so what can we expect on Monday? And so here again, I'll, I'll focus mainly on this, this path of totality in, in southeastern Missouri here, uh, roughly from Poplar Bluff up to, to Cape Girardeau, where we're thinking around 2 p.m. That's, that's when we're going to look at the forecast here. And what we can see is, is by Monday morning, all of that rainfall from Sunday is, is pushing off to the east. Uh, we still got a cold front crossing the state, but that cold front is going to help to kick clouds out of the area. And so as of right now, the main thing we're watching is how fast is this rain and cloud cover going to clear out on Monday. And right now, the forecast does look like we'll clear out in time for the eclipse. And so I do want to note, we are forecasting cloud cover and there's quite a bit of uncertainty. So we'll have to watch the trends, but the forecast looks pretty good for Monday. And so here's from the National Weather Service, our probability of precipitation, anywhere from five to 15%. Uh, that's pretty negligible. But here we can look at the forecast for percentage of sky cover. Uh, and this is for Monday afternoon at, at 1 p.m. Central. And we see anywhere from 20 to 30% sky cover. And so this means we won't have perfectly blue skies, but this is mostly sunny or mostly clear conditions. So these would be great for viewing the eclipse. And so this is the good news. The, the forecast could certainly change. So if you're making plans for the eclipse, uh, I would definitely advise you to keep up with that forecast over the next few days. But um, Monday afternoon is, is certainly looking good for Missouri at the moment. And real quick, be before I finish looking ahead into further next week, uh, these are the, the eight to 14 day outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center does look like there's a increased probability for above normal temperatures getting into mid-April. To me, this shows that, that on the horizon, we don't see uh, any strong chance of uh, a really widespread hard freeze or cold snap. Uh, so that's good uh, for those that are already getting into the garden. And then when we look at our eight to 14 day precipitation, currently not a lot of confidence in that forecast. Uh, near normal precipitations, mo most of the forecast here for Missouri. Um, but otherwise, that's all I've got for today. And again, if you've got plans for the eclipse on Monday, I, I hope you enjoy that and the weather cooperates. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Thank you, Zach. Lilacs are going to be blooming here soon, and maybe they are in the very southern part of the state. And I know that's one of my favorite flowers, but I know we're a few weeks away from them blooming here in Kirksville. And Kelly uh, McGowan is going to talk to us about lilacs. Okay, let me get this pulled up here. Uh, yes, Jennifer, it's certainly one of my favorites too. I absolutely love lilacs. I've loved them my entire life and hopefully all of you listening do too. And if you're not currently growing these, I encourage you to do so. Okay, let me get this going. Um, okay, there we go. 
Well, lilacs are an old-fashioned, spring-blooming, deciduous shrub that can live for many, many years. And often, we will see lilacs surviving at old homesteads, kind of like you see in this photo here. Um, my uh, grandmother had one at her house that was well over 50 years old, and I have gotten lots of starts from it from over the years. Um, so if you do have a family member that has a really old um, lilac bush, consider uh, taking some starts from that. But yeah, an old-fashioned plant, they do bloom this time of the year. We are starting to see some blooms down in the really southern part of Missouri and even around the Springfield area as well. So they are starting to bloom. Uh, lilacs can be planted in a hedgerow or a windbreak. They will um, eventually kind of grow together and make this nice hedgerow that is really beautiful when it is in full flower. They make a wonderful cut flower and the fragrance. Oh my goodness. The fragrance is just absolutely incredible. Um, so most of us are familiar with the, kind of the old-fashioned, you know, purple lilacs, but if you really want to kind of get into it a little further, there's a lot of cultivars, um, including what you see here in this photo, including some white ones, um, all shades of purple, and um, just, just a lot of different ones to choose from if you like lilacs. So lilacs will uh, put out root sprouts or suckers, and this is the easiest way to get a propagation. So if you, again, if you have a family member that has a plant that you want to get starts from, just get down there at the base and you'll see these suckers sprouting up. And you can just get a hand trowel or a shovel and just gently dig those up and transplant them wherever you would like. Easy as that. They do need a full sun location. They need well-drained soil. Um, if you are going for the hedgerow appearance, about six to seven feet apart is, is ideal because they do get quite large. Uh, they don't need a lot of pruning, very, very minimal pruning. Remember, lilacs are going to bloom on last year's growth. So if you get a little overzealous with your pruning, your pruning, you may cut out branches that would produce blooms this year. So certainly keep that in mind. And then as far as insects and diseases, uh, there is a borer uh, that will bore into lilac canes. And if you ever see canes start to die out of your plant, um, if you cut one of those open, you may find one of these borers inside. But certainly remove those canes, get them out of the planting, destroy those um, so that that cycle doesn't continue. And of course, powdery mildew is very common on lilacs. Uh, the one I was telling you about that my grandma had, had powdery mildew every year, still survived, uh, still produced lots of beautiful blooms. Um, so you don't have to treat, but you can if you want to. Um, and then occasionally we'll see some fire blight issues on lilacs as well. Um, I do want to mention this one here. This one's called a bloomerang, and basically what this is is a type of lilac that will bloom um, continually throughout the summer, but it's not going to be as heavy of a bloom as the first spring bloom. So if you want to continue to enjoy those blooms, you might consider one of these re-blooming varieties. And then as far as fresh bouquets, um, choose flowers that are open. Once you cut that from the plant, they won't continue to open. So make sure all of the little individual flowers are open and cut it at that time. And just use a sturdy vase because this is a woody plant, the, the cuttings are kind of heavy, so a good glass vase should work fine. Um, remove any leaves below the water, the water line in the vase, and then change out that water often. And, um, you know, put bouquets of lilacs in several rooms of your home. It's just amazing. The smell is amazing, but it's just for a short period of time. So enjoy it while they're here. And Jennifer, that's all I have. Thank you, Kelly. And now Justin will talk about lawn care and myth busting. So 
I was inspired to do a presentation today on lawn care myths because I had a situation um, where a homeowner did something that ended up really uh, damaging their lawn. So, hey, Justin, stop right there. Uh, we cannot hear you that well. Check your mic, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so I was inspired to do this presentation uh, because I had a homeowner call me that did something that really um, damaged their lawn. So uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of misinformation and myths online. So uh, there is a lot of misinformation out there, you know, regardless of whether it's gardening or anything else. But some of the gardening related stuff isn't necessarily science based or it's based on kind of a misunderstanding of science. So you could end up wasting money, you could damage or kill your lawn. Um, and soil testing, which we offer and other private labs offer, can give you ac accurate info and recommendations if you're, if you're thinking about fertilizing in particular. So this situation with this homeowner involved Epsom salts and you know, there's a lot of information about Epsom salts and gardening, but I just started kind of going down a rabbit hole, um, finding some information from different lawn care websites and kind of garden websites. So some of them said Epsom salts contain iron to help green up your lawn. Um, Epsom salts actually don't contain iron. Uh, folks, you know, also broadly kind of say grass needs magnesium. Uh, in Missouri, we have very few soils that are magnesium deficient. Uh, sulfur and the Epsom salts will help my soil pH. Uh, sulfur can lower soil pH if it's elemental sulfur, but that's generally not a problem in Missouri. Um, and in fact, Epsom salts, that form of sulfur has no impact on soil pH. Uh, fun fact, Epsom salts were discovered in a kind of spa town in England called Epsom. Um, and evaporated, and that's how originally Epsom salts were discovered. So what happened was um, this homeowner called me. She had applied 15 pounds of Epsom salts to a rather small lawn in front of a condo. Um, she had planted sod two years ago, and unfortunately that sod was mostly killed, um, and this is because excess salts can burn plants. So um, not necessarily sodium chloride or table salt, any salt, whether it's a fertilizer or a non-fertilizer salt, can can damage or kill plants. And this is because it it can draw water from the leaves or prevent uh, the root uptake of water. So at this, when we talk about lawns, we often talk about rates per thousand square feet. So this Epsom salts in this circumstance was applied at a rate of 50 pounds per thousand square feet. An actual recommendation for a field crop setting would be if the soil was extremely magnesium deficient, we would put 9.5 pounds per thousand. That would be incorporated into the soil. In this circumstance, it was just broadcast directly on top of the turf. So um, this homer ended up putting five times the rate that would be suggested in magnesium deficient soils. And as I mentioned, Missouri does not really have, uh, has very few soils that are magnesium deficient. <clears throat> so, I kind of went down another rabbit hole because I, in one of these articles about Epsom salts, I came across this homemade lawn food recipe and it, it kind of said, well, you know, this is a chemistry based recipe. And I was kind of curious to take a look at this a little bit more. So beer, shampoo, club soda, Epsom salts, ammonia. So the, the website said beer helps feed good soil bacteria. So, Carbs and protein do contain nitrogen and carbon. We know that nitrogen is an important plant nutrient. Um, and there's a little bit of nitrogen and protein. But if we were to calculate it out, our normal recommendation would be one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. To get that down, it would take 1,400 bottles of beer. And if you buy really cheap beer, that would be about 870 bucks. There is some carbon in beer, um, but one beer would contain as much carbon as about a tablespoon of compost. So $868 of beer would add about as much organic matter as 93 cents of compost. 
Uh, to give you an idea, on a regular nitrogen application per thousand square feet at one pound would be about six bucks for a common green up lawn fertilizer, about 10 bucks for an organic fertilizer. And to get a good rate um, in a lawn that had deficient organic matter, we'd recommend maybe like a quarter inch. That would be about 24 bucks. And that would give you as much organic matter um, as 1,400 bottles of beer. So the baby shampoo, the website said it allows soil to open up and help solution adhere to soil and grass effectively. Um, surfactants are used to break water tension and can help pesticides and micronutrients adhere to leaf tissue. And soap can be used as a surfactant. Um, there are no pesticides or micronutrients in this formula, so you wouldn't need a surfactant. Um, surfactants can be used to help potting mixes absorb water, but native soil in a lawn doesn't need surfactants to absorb water. The next ingredient was one cup of club soda, and the website stated carbonation delivers good source of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and mineral salts. So you don't need to worry about applying carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen because plants can get this either from the atmosphere um, or from water. The mineral salt concentration in a cup of club soda would be so negligible but that it's it wouldn't really impact any kind of plant growth. Uh, the recipe also called for a half cup of Epsom salt. I kind of went over that uh, part of it already. The recipe called for one cup of ammonia, and it said this delivers a large dose of nitrogen, which mimics store-bought fertilizer. So household ammonia does contain about 4% nitrogen, uh, but plants utilize nitrogen in the form of ammonium and nitrate. So they don't use ammonia nitrogen, excuse me, ammonia nitrogen, um, ammonia in that form off gases into the atmosphere. And if you've ever used ammonia solution to clean windows, you know that you can kind of smell it off gassing. Uh, ammonia is used as anhydrous ammonia for uh, corn production where they inject it as a gas into the soil. Now, aqueous ammonia in solution is toxic to plants and ammonia also has a really high pH that can burn your eyes skin and potentially plant cuticles so the ammonia unfortunately although it does contain nitrogen is not going to give the form of nitrogen to plants that they need so i i calculated the cost for this recipe based off of the ingredients of the ammonia uh, a, a can of really really cheap beer shampoo epsom salts and uh Carbonate, uh, carbonated water. So it cost about 439 per, th per thousand square feet, and it would give you as much nitrogen as uh, a tenth of a penny. It would give you as much compost value as five one hundredths of a penny, and it would give you this magnesium and sulfur. Like I said, most Missouri soils don't need magnesium, so this $4.39 of home lawn food would give you as much value as about a tenth of a penny if you were going to compare it to an application of nitrogen fertilizer or compost. So um, there's a lot cheaper way to get you where you want to go. And this homemade lawn food recipe could potentially cause more harm um, than good. So I was, I was just wondering like, well, there's got to be something to this, you know, um, why are people doing this? So the website I looked at had before and after photos. One week later, the grass is noticeably filled out, thicker and greener. It also went from being mostly bare to totally green and filled out. And when I looked a little bit closer, it's not actually the same patch of grass. The second photo had clover and Bermuda grass that was very well filled out and that growth couldn't have happened um, in one week. So it, it wasn't the same patch of soil. So just keep in mind, social media, different websites, they might not be selling you a product, but they're generating ad revenue from clicks on those sites or those posts. Um, it's either not science-based. In this case, it was kind of pitched as it's chemistry-based, but uh, it was based kind of on a mis misunderstanding of some of these different sciences so university-based resources you can kind of rest assured that um, they're not trying to sell you anything and they're giving you the best research backed information available so 
that is it on my on my myth busting for today. Well, Justin, that was really interesting and uh, good information. So thank you. And now Donna is going to talk about rotating crops in the garden. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Okay, so I get this question all the time. So what do you mean by crop rotation when we're talking about vegetable gardens? How can that help me? Um, so um, just to start off, uh, crop rotation is an old agricultural cultural practice where we change the location of where we plant certain plants in the vegetable garden. So for example, your tomato should never be in the same spot uh, more than one year. So we need to rotate where we put it. It is showing, research is showing that it reduced pests. It uh, limits the development of diseases um, and it helps us to manage fertility. And we'll talk about uh, some of that here coming up. Um, so everybody should be doing crop rotation, whether that means you're doing a three-year crop rotation, a five-year crop rotation. It can be as complicated as you want it, or it can be as simple as you can keep it. So um, what we find is that it works best if you try to rotate between plant families. So uh, what we find is that plants within the same family such as tomatoes are in relation with potatoes, are in relation with peppers and eggplants. So that would those all would be in the same family. They often are susceptible to the same bugs, the same diseases, and the same issues. And so we find that if we can separate those or if we can uh, rotate where we put them in the garden from year to year, we can actually help prevent some of those issues. We find that three to five years is best. A five rotation is the best possible one. But most of us only have gardens big enough to really accommodate a three-year rotation. So for me, I have a uh, about a, a 25 by 50 garden. So 25 by 50 feet. And so I can effectively go from tomatoes from one end one year to the other end the second year. And in the third year, I'll put them in the middle. So I'm significantly changing where I put my tomatoes from year to year. And so in order to be able to do a crop rotation, you actually have to be drawing out your garden from year to year and keeping track where you put things. And it never fails every year. Me and my husband look at each other and go, uh, where did we put the potatoes last year? And we have to go sorting through our paperwork and say, okay, it was on the upper end. So this year we need to go to the lower end. And so it, it becomes a, a important task to actually be able to rotate those garden plants. Um, you can actually include cover crops into the, the, to the rotation that really helps break things up. You can actually leave areas fallow, which means empty during the garden season. So, you know, if you know that you've had a bad problem with certain things, um, in a certain area, you could leave that out one year. And a lot of times our diseases will actually burn out within two to three years. And so having it empty is not always a bad thing. Um, and then uh, once again, I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm gonna repeat this again, but it's very important. Keep that sketch of the garden every year to track those locations. That is one of my biggest tools I use um, to deter determine the next year where I'm going to put things. These are the plant family. So um, if you remember that, you know, you really need to rotate where you put these. You can actually um, come up with a pretty good rotation that you know that carrots can split up uh, members of the onion family and, and the cucurbit family and um, the solanaceous family, which is the tomatoes. So this just breaks it up to where it's more manageable and you can start thinking, okay, so I can't put this by this, but I can, you know, I, you know, it gets a little complicated sometimes, but having it out on paper and drawing a three year um, garden plan is really the best in trying to come up with a good rotation. Then anytime you have questions about what goes with what or, you know, where, what you should be doing it, or even if you're doing it right, reach out to one of us um, in the horticulture field. Uh, we're more than happy to help you and, and to take a look at your sketch and maybe talk about why it, it's, it's, 
you know, good or bad or whether you need to shuffle things around or, you know, just, just give you an overall uh, look at things. This is an example that I came up with on, on rotation. Actually, this is from Florida State. And so for year one, it shows tomatoes uh, followed by legumes, followed by carrots in one year. Um, year two would be carrots, tomatoes, and legumes. So they just switched the order. And year three, it switched again. So, and th this is each spot in each garden. Um, but once you get the hang of it the first couple of years, it, it, it gets easier and easier. But sitting down once again and drawing it out helps a lot in, in that. Now, some of you tell me, oh, I, my area is too small. I can't do rotation very well. Well, here's some ideas. If you have small plots, uh, some things that you might be able to do. Well, one is have multiple small spaces, not just one or two. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people that only have one or two raised beds. We'll go ahead and put a third raised bed in there because then you can have that three rotation, three year rotation. So the tomatoes will be in bed one the first year, bed two the second year, bed three the, the third year. And then on that fourth year, they're back in the original spot. Um, plant families in separate beds and rotate the whole bed each time. And that's sort of what I was talking about. You know, it does not hurt to put the tomatoes and potatoes together. You just work them as one unit. Um, now, as I talked about earlier, in, if you have a great big garden, then you can separate those plants within families too, and it works really well. Uh, use pots or containers for disease-prone tomato uh, plants, such as tomatoes. Um, and that's one thing we recommend. Uh, but remember, tomatoes need bigger than a five gallon bucket. They need bigger than a 15 inch pot because they have an extensive root system and they get fairly large. So even though you might put it in a big pot, just keep in mind, you can still have problems, but you can definitely use those pots in, in that rotation. And you can also use your existing home landscape to uh, rotate into. So if you only have one or two spots that you can put things, definitely if you have room in your landscapes, and you know, put that tomato in your landscape or that cucumber plant or that zucchini plant. It's still a rotation out of the garden area. Um, and so once again, if you have any questions whatsoever at any time, feel free to reach out to any one of us and, and talk about rotation. Okay, back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Donna. Good information. Well, Easter was just a few days ago, and some of you may have received a potted Easter lily, or maybe you received a pot of bulb flowers, and now you're not sure what to do with them. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about Easter lilies first, and a little bit about where they came from, and then we'll get into how to care for them. So uh, Easter lilies are native to southern Japan. They are used in Easter celebrations around the world, and Easter lilies represent rebirth and hope just as the resurrection does in the Christian faith. Easter lilies are grown by farmers in the coastal area between California and Oregon. And these farmers grow nearly all the Easter lily bulbs sold in America. This area is known as the Easter lily capital of the world. And they produce about 95% of all the bulbs grown in the world for the potted Easter lily market. And below here, you see a photo, and this is a commercial field in that area that is growing Easter lily bulbs specifically for the Easter lily uh, market. Easter lilies are the fourth largest crop and wholesale value in the U United States uh, planted, potted plant market, even though there's only about a two week window of sales. And here you see some of the Easter lilies that are grown in commercial greenhouses. Poinsettias, chrysanthemums, and azaleas rank first, second, and third, and then Easter lilies rank fourth in the potted uh, plant market. If you received an Easter lily, you want to keep it away from drafts and heat sources, such as appliances and heating vents. You also want to keep uh, potted plants away from fruit because they give off ethylene, which is a colorless, odorless hormone. You can't see that, but it will cause your flowers to turn brown faster. You want your potted plant in bright, indirect light with daytime temperatures between 65 and 75 degrees. You also don't want to overwater your potted plant. You want to water it when it feels dry to the touch.
to prolong the life of Easter lily uh, blooms, you can take out that uh, middle section, which is yellow. That's the anther. That's the uh, pollen producing uh, structure of the flower. So you can take that out and that will prevent uh, yellow smudging on the petals. Do not throw away your Easter lily after it is done blooming. You can cut off the stalk and then plant it outdoors. You wanna plant them in a sunny uh, location with well-drained soil. And you don't wanna cut back the stem and the foliage until it dies down in the fall. And then you wanna mulch it really well before winter. And the photo here shows you an Easter lily. And this is in my landscape. This is one I planted about four years ago. It was in our church uh, first during Easter Sunday. And then I took it and several of them home, planted it in my flower bed, and they bloom uh, every year now. They don't bloom on Easter, but they do bloom in June, and they, they're beautiful, and they even they have a scent. But you want to make sure that you do mulch them well uh, before going into winter. And these uh, photos are of some of mine in bloom. Not right now, but they will bloom in June, and they will be beautiful like you see here. Uh, but if you're going, going to uh, have them in your house and, and you want to prevent that smudging, you, you know, you take out the anthers because you, you can see the smudging of the petals right here where that pollen has fallen. So you can take out those anthers and that will prevent that. And then if you receive some spring flowers like tulips, hyacinths, daffodils, you can cut off the flower head when they are finished blooming. When the foliage turns yellow or brown and starts to die back, you can take the bulbs out of the pot. So just carefully lift them up out of the pot. You can cut off the dead stem and the foliage and then place the bulbs in a dry, dark, cool place until fall. So you might put them in a, a, a box, a cardboard box or a brown paper bag and then just leave them till fall. And then you can uh, plant them outdoors in a uh, bulb bed and you can um, plant them as you normally would. And then uh, in the spring, you'll have uh, flowers again, hopefully. You can also put them uh, back into a pot and then you can leave your pot outdoors. And then when you see about an inch of growth in the spring coming up, you can bring that pot indoors. You can also put them in a refrigerator for about 16 weeks and force them into bloom. And then enjoy the blooms. And that's all I have. Uh, Jennifer, we have one uh, question in the chat for you. And I will also mention the pollen on the lilies. That will stain clothes, too, I know from experience. So, um, But the question in the chat, uh, when you say keep lilies away from drafts and fruit, how far away do you mean? Yeah, I don't know if I have an exact a distance, but I would keep them several, several feet away. You know, I wouldn't put, you know, just moving them one or two feet across the table is not going to be enough. So, you know, we're a different room uh, across the room. OK, so, you know, if you have a, a 20, 30 foot room, different ends would likely be OK. Um, different areas of the house. Uh, you know, just not a few feet apart. You know, I, I would probably do at least 10 feet or more. Again, I don't have an exact number, but I think at least 10 feet or more would be ideal. Okay, very good. And Jennifer, we have one other uh, question in the chat for Donna. Um, the question is, is when you're doing garden rotation, um, how far do those beds need to be from the previous year? Do they need to be in a separate garden bed completely? Or what about some distance on that? Donna, do you have any thoughts on that? That yeah. can be kind of tricky to answer. Yeah. Well, once again, I don't think that that's any specific distance uh, for rotating. I think I think it's just as long as the crop was not is not planted where last crop was. And it can be a completely different bed, but it doesn't have to. For example, my garden is um, a 25 by 25 feet by 50 feet. I can effectively plant my tomatoes on one end. Then the next year it'll be on the other end. And then the third year it'll be in the middle. And because I do it that way, it will never be planted in the exact same spot as the previous year. I think that's the concentration is you know, just don't plant it where it was last year. Many different ways to rotate. Thank you.
All right, moving on to our next topic. Uh, Kelly is going to talk about fire blight. All right, let me get this pulled up. Okay, all right. Well, um, it is almost fire blight season, so let's talk a little bit about that so you can kind of be on the lookout because it is a disease that we see in Missouri every year, and it is a bacterial disease. So many of our, or most of our plant diseases are going to be fungal, some viral, and a few are going to be vac bacterial. And so fire blight is definitely a bacterial disease, and it is spread around by insects flying from tree to tree, uh, windblown rain, and infected garden tools. And typically the uh, trees that we see affected by fire blight are apples, crab apples, Bradford pear, and hawthorn. Uh, fire blight overwinters on the tree in cankers, and cankers are a sunken area on the stem. Kind of hard to see with the naked eye unless you're looking really closely, but it's a sunken area and that's where the bacteria overwinters. Um, as we get into early spring, kind of about right now, those cankers will start to produce this sticky substance. And um, then blossoms will start to open, and they're usually affected first because that sticky substance is on the tree that contains that bacterial disease. And those blossoms are the first to open, so they usually get infected first and they will turn brown and die. Uh, tender new shoots are also susceptible to fire blight and you will often uh, see them affected as well. And what will happen is these affected areas will get this shepherd's hook appearance and that's kind of what you can see here in this lower right picture. That is a, a classic shepherd's hook appearance and that's what we look at a lot when we um, try to identify fire blight. Another thing that you can uh, use as a diagnostic tool is that in addition to the shepherd's hook, uh, the leaves, the dead leaves will re remain attached to those shoots so they don't fall from the tree, they remain attached. Okay, and as far as treatment, it is difficult to control. There's not, you know, just a simple chemical you can go buy and spray your tree and be done with it. Uh, bacterial diseases are very difficult to control. There are some resistant cultivars on the market of some of those trees that I just mentioned. And remember that resistant doesn't mean 100% 100% resistant. It'll be um, it'll have some resistance, and if it does get fire blight, it won't be as bad. So there are resistant cultivars. Um, that you can plant. Don't over fertilize. What happens when you over fertilize is that you get a lot of lush foliar growth on the tree and again tender shoots with new growth are very susceptible to fire blight so we don't want to encourage that at all. Uh, fire blight does run in cycles, however, it doesn't typically kill trees. Um, you will have some, you know, browning in some of your trees, but it doesn't typically kill the tree. You can prune out the diseased branches. Just make sure that you are disinfecting your pruners between cuts. And I know we talk about that a lot, but it's extremely important in this case. Um, between cuts, use Lysol spray or a bleach solution or something to disinfect those pruners. And then cut well below the affected area, 8 to 12 inches below that affected area. And then once you cut that branch out, dispose of it, burn it. Um, don't just leave it laying there near your tree. And then as far as a spray, you can use a Bordeaux mixture, which is a combination of copper sulfate, lime, and water. This is typically done during dormancy and bud break. Uh, streptomycin can also be used uh, during the bloom cycle. Often you'll see this used as a rotation between the Bordeaux mixture and the streptomycin because resistance from these bacteria 
um, has has been shown to some of these chemicals. So we don't want to overuse these chemicals and let this bacteria build up more resistance. So uh, a, a rotation of chemicals is, is recommended. And we do have an extension guide on this, uh, 06020, um, if you want more information. And Jennifer, that's all I have. Thank you, Kelly. And now Justin will talk about organic fertilizer options. Okay. So, sorry, I need to move this bar out of the way. Uh, we had a follow-up question in the chat box. I'll just uh, reference. And, you know, the thing with these, these homemade recipes, um, they might not have actually any kind of value at all in terms of fertilizing or feeding microbes. Um, and so you, you're going to end up spending a lot of money to do something like this homemade lawn food every week. And there could be detrimental effects to using something like that. So there are a lot cheaper and kind of tried and true ways um, to fertilize the lawn and add organic matter if it's needed. So but on that note, uh, I know folks are, you know, getting started in the vegetable garden. We always have a lot of folks, uh, excuse me, a lot of questions about organic gardening, organic pest management, organic fertility management. Um, fertility management is something that I uh, am really interested in, work with a lot of uh, fruit and vegetable growers on fertility management. And so you know, when I think broadly about fertility management, we think about things like manures and we think about things like cover crops. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm not really going to go into cover crops uh, during this presentation. We just don't have time to cover both topics, but I do want to talk a little bit about some of the organic fertilizer options. So if we're comparing um, conventional or synthetic fertilizers to organic or non-synthetic uh, with conventional fertilizers, we have a lot of water-soluble options. They're easy to source from your local uh, hardware store or co-op. That can be immediate release in terms of all the nutrients being immediately available to plants. They can also come in coated slow release or metered release, which would be something like an Osmocote or a similar product. Uh, for the most part, there's there's no microbes really involved in releasing those nutrients. And if you do want to fertigate or um, apply a liquid fertilizer, either, either with a watering can or through drip lines, there are a lot of options. There is concern with uh, synthetic fertilizers with kind of thinking about the carbon footprint. So, for example, nitrogen, uh, synthetic nitrogen sources come from nitrogen that's been captured from the atmosphere in a process called the Haber-Bosch process uh, that involves a lot of pressure and heat to be able to convert that atmospheric nitrogen um, into a form of nitrogen that plants can use. So that's one way to kind of think about, you know, the environmental consequences or the carbon footprint of uh, the fertilizers, fertilizers that we're using. When we think about organic sources, um, there's fewer water-soluble options. These are generally medium to slow-release nutrients. There are definitely microbes are required to release these nutrients. And because microbes are kind of mediating the release of these plant nutrients, that's dependent on time, temperature, and moisture in the soil. If we do want to fertigate using a liquid fertilizer, um, there's few available sources and they tend to be very expensive. But if we think about these organic nutrients, um, for the most part, we're thinking about recycled, at least as far as nitrogen goes, recycled sources, plant and animal byproducts, for example. So I talked about the microbes. Um, that nutrient release is mediated by this microbial activity. So if we look at the image on the left, um, nutrients are stored in soil organisms and soil organic matter. And as these microorganisms break down and release nutrients, either by consuming other organisms or by, by consuming plant or animal waste, they release these nutrients in the inorganic form. Now, I know this is kind of confusing because we're talking about organic, synthetic, 
plants take up nutrients in the inorganic form, which means there's no carbon associated with it. Um, this is ammonium and this is nitrate. Those are the two nitrogen sources that plants take in. So the organic materials that we apply to the soil, the microbes feed on them and then release the nutrients in their inorganic form. And there's a whole uh, cadre of organisms that exist in the soil that cycle organic matter and release these plant nutrients. So raw manure, um, you know, if you have chickens or if you have friends that have chickens, chicken litter is a really good source. Um, you know, it can be sourced commercially on a larger scale, but it's higher nitrogen, has a good balanced um, ratio of nutrients in it. Horse manure is horse manure is very readily available. It does have a lot lower nutrient value and tends to have a lot of different weed seeds in it that are not um, digested or destroyed in, uh, in digestion. There is a concern with produce safety with raw manure, so we want to make sure that we apply um, that stuff a couple months in advance. It's safest to apply it in the fall because there are things like E. coli and salmonella that could be in that manure. Uh, you can burn plants with too much manure at once, so you want to apply based on soil test results. There are some concerns with herbicide contamination and manure. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail on that, but we do. There is a way to test with green beans to see whether your compost or manure has any kind of herbicide contamination in it. So you can categorize these broadly into things of animal origin. This is be your manure, blood meal feather meal, mineral origin. These would be your mined materials like potassium sulfate and rock phosphate. These are all things that you could use in a certified organic system. They could be plant derived or byproducts of, of processing plants. They could be blended. So they could have a combination of animal, mineral, and plants. They could be processed manures. Now these are generally heat treated. So that pathogen risk is, is mitigated. Um, and you could use compost. We generally don't necessarily think of this as a fertilizer, but it has a lot of nutrient value. And then there's other ways to break these down. There are some that are nitrogen rich, some that are phosphorus rich, some that are potassium rich. Uh, I mentioned raw manure. The analysis of that varies greatly with chicken litter, litter being a good balanced, um, good balanced option. And there, as I mentioned, there's these uh, blended options that you could get a more balanced ratio of nutrients. In terms of the fertilizer value, most folks have probably seen this before, but on the left-hand side, we have a 14% nitrogen fertilizer. And on the right-hand side, we have one that's 4% nitrogen, 3% phosphorus, and 2% potassium. So those different fertilizer bags contain a different amount of nutrients. Cost though, it can vary hugely. So there's this uh, liquid amino soy protein hydrolysate. This is a new organic fertilizer. That's gonna cost 30 pounds, th pardon me, $30 per pound of nitrogen. And there's a great variation all the way down to like bulk poultry litter. If you're buying this from a chicken farm to 58 cents per pound of nitrogen. This is a calculator that's really helpful from University of Georgia. Um, it's nice because you can put in the amount of nutrients you need per thousand square feet that could be based off a soil test. Down at the bottom here, you can put in the fertilizer grade and the price per pound. And I just wanted to show here this 432. This is a very small bag of chicken litter. So it's $2 and 50 pounds for that uh, of that. And then this 532.5, this is a 50 pound bag. So it's a lot cheaper per pound. This 1300 is feather meal, but you put the different options in the prices, you click calculate and it gives you these recommendations. So if you were gonna use 20 pounds of the like small expensive bag of chicken litter and a little bit of feather meal, it would be 137 bucks. But if you use that 50 pound bag that's cheaper, it would only cost you $12.91. So there's a lot of variation in cost and you can save a lot of money if you spend a little bit of time looking at that. Uh, a soil test is the best place to start. 
a lot of vegetable gardens that have been gardened for a while, they only need nitrogen. So if you wanted an organic source that was only nitrogen, you could use something like feather meal, blood meal, alfalfa meal, or corn, corn gluten meal. You could also use a legume cover crop in the fall like clover. Always compare costs. Organic fertilizers work best when they're incorporated because that gives microbes a chance to digest them and excrete um, nutrients in an organic form. And last but not least, don't overdo your organic matter. If you're, if you have organic matter that's six to 8%, you don't really need to add any more compost. You can start getting things out of balance and elevate phosphorus levels to a point to where it's going to create some antagonistic um, interactions between those different nutrients. So... Uh, Justin, we have one question for you. Um, there's sure. a question in the chat about using raw chicken lit about using raw chicken litter due to bacteria. So I would never discourage any. Well, so yes, there can be E. coli and salmonella and and chicken litter. Um, in any raw manure, there can be pathogens that can cause people to get sick. But for instance, if they're applied in the fall to give you uh, a couple of months, you know, four months there, those pathogens will be degraded and broken down over time because they need they need a host to survive. So if you're going to use raw manure, apply it in the fall. Um, and if you're going to use a processed manure that's been heat treated or pelletized in a bag, you can use that safely within the growing season. All right, Justin, go ahead and close this out because it is after one o'clock. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Um, okay, so um, thanks for joining us, folks. Uh, you can check check us out next week, same time, same place. If you have questions, go ahead and submit them in that um, at the IPM website. You can also attach photos. We like getting questions from across the state, and we like answering those. Um, live during the garden hour. Uh, once again, if you don't know your hort specialist and you want to connect with them and have questions or need help with gardening stuff, um, please reach out. You can find them on this, their emails here. You can also search on your webpage for your MU Extension County office, and that will also connect you to your local hort specialist. So um, thanks everybody for joining us, and I hope you have a great week.